If you've read the book, you know that's one of the many wonderful phrases in the book. So can I get you guys to all say that with me? Holy Bagumba! All right. Well, my name is Holly, and I want to welcome you to Red Balloon. Thanks so much for coming out on this very cold day, but we're nice and warm in here. Um, and I want to thank you for being here and showing your support for a local author. And yes, Kate DiCamillo is local. Um, and also for showing your support for a local independent bookstore. Red Balloon has been here for 29 years. And we've been, yeah, we've been connecting people of all ages with great children's and young adult books. And because you guys buy your gifts and books here, we are able to keep our doors open and do great events like this. So again, thank you for supporting us. Thank you for supporting our community. All right. Okay, so today we are so excited to have Kate DiCamillo at Red Balloon. Kate is the author of many wonderful books for young readers, including Because of When Dixie, which received a Newbery honor, and The Tell of Despero, which received a Newbery medal. Um, also, The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane, the best-selling Mercy Watsi series, and many, many more. Um, we have those books on display back over there, so if you're not familiar with all of Kate's books, take a look. Her new book that we're going to hear more about today is Flora and Ulysses, The Illuminated Adventures. This book is full of love and wisdom and humor. It came out in September and was nominated for the National Book Award and is now on many best of the year lists. Kate's been very busy this fall touring the country with, the, with Flora and Ulysses. So now we are happy to welcome her home. So please help us welcome Kate to Red Balloon and congratulate her on Flora and Ulysses, The Illuminated Adventures. How are y'all doing? Can you hear me all the way there in the back? Look happy if that's the case. All right. So has anybody read this yet? What a nice group of children down there. Did an adult make you read it or did you read it on your own? School. Well, an adult made you read it. So you won't mind hearing a little bit about it again. So for those of you who uh, know nothing about it, um, it's kind of, it's got graphic novel elements in it. Uh, and it starts with uh, a cartoon uh, strip panel. Um, and since, uh, uh, if you have a book, follow along. If not, I'll describe what's going on. It begins in the Tickham kitchen late on a summer afternoon. So there's Mrs. Tickham. She's sitting there reading a poetry book. Mr. Tickham, and there's a gigantic vacuum cleaner with a bow on it. And Mr. Tickham is looking very pleased with himself. Um, and uh, Mrs. Tickham looks up from her to poetry book and she asks him what's going on and he says, happy birthday. <laughs> he is going to give her this vacuum cleaner as a birthday gift. And um, she's not terribly excited, however he is. He says it's a Ulysses 2000X. It's super suction. It's multi-terrain. It's the crown jewel of vacuums. It features an extra long cord so that absolutely no mess, no dirt is ever out of your reach. It's indoor, outdoor. It goes everywhere. It does everything. To which Mrs. Tickham responds, goody. So she's gone back to like reading her poetry book. And he's like, oh, come on. You have to try it out. Turn it on. So he plugs it in. She turns it on, and, and like in very short order, the vacuum cleaner, which is incredibly powerful, uh, sucks up her poetry books, an entire box of buttered up uh, crackers, and also Mr. Tickham's pants, <laughs> which 
doesn't upset him at all because he's so pleased by how powerful this vacuum cleaner is. And he's so overjoyed, he suggests that she try it outside. Um, and that's how it all began with a vacuum cleaner, really. So that's the prologue. Now I'm going to read you chapter one. Flora Bell Buckman was in her room at her desk. She was very busy. She was doing two things at once. She was ignoring her mother, and she was also reading a comic book entitled The Illuminated Adventures of the Amazing Incandesto. Flora, her mother shouted, what are you doing up there? I'm reading, Flora shouted back. Remember the contract, her mother shouted. Do not forget the contract. At the beginning of summer, in a moment of weakness, Flora had made the mistake of signing a contract that said that she would, quote, work to turn her face away from the idiotic hijinks of comics and toward the bright light of true literature, end quote. Those were the exact words of the contract. They were her mother's words. Flora's mother was a writer. She was divorced and she wrote romance novels. Talk about idiotic hijinks. Flora hated romance novels. In fact, she hated romance. I hate romance, said Flora out loud to herself. She liked the way the words sounded. She imagined them floating above her in a comic strip bubble. It was a comforting thing to have words hanging over her head, especially negative words about romance. Flora's mother had often accused Flora of being a natural born cynic. Flora suspected that this was true. She was a natural born cynic who lived in defiance of contracts. Yep, thought Flora, that's me. She bent her head and went back to reading about the amazing incandesto. She was interrupted a few minutes later by a very loud noise. It sounded as if a jet plane had landed in the Tickham's backyard. What the heck, said Flora. She got up from her desk and looked out the window and saw Mrs. Tickham running around the backyard with a shiny, oversized vacuum cleaner. It looked like she was vacuuming the yard. That can't be, thought Flora. Who vacuums their yard? Actually, it didn't look like Mrs. Tickham knew what she was doing. It was more like the vacuum cleaner was in charge, and the vacuum cleaner seemed to be out of its mind, or its engine, or something. A few bolts shy of a load, said Flora out loud. And then she saw that Mrs. Tickham and the vacuum cleaner were headed directly for a squirrel. <laughs> hey now, said Flora. She banged on the window. Watch out, she shouted. You're going to vacuum up that squirrel. She said the words and then she had a strange moment of seeing them hanging there over her head. You're going to vacuum up that squirrel. There's just no predicting what kind of sentences you might say, thought Flora. For instance, who would ever think you would shout, you're going to vacuum up that squirrel? <laughs> it didn't make any difference, though, what words she said. Flora was too far away, the vacuum cleaner was too loud, and also, clearly, it was bent on destruction. This malfeasance must be stopped, said Flora in a deep and super heroic voice. This malfeasance must be stopped was what the unassuming janitor Alfred T. Slipper always said before he was transformed into the amazing incandesto and became a towering crime-fighting pillar of light. Unfortunately, Alfred T. Slipper wasn't present. Where was incandesto when you needed him? Not that Flora really believed in superheroes, but still. She stood at the window and watched as the squirrel was vacuumed up. Poof, thwomp, holy bagumba, said Flora. <laughs> so those of you who have read it, you know the squirrel does not die, and he does not die through the efforts of uh, the cynic, Flora, who performs CPR on the squirrel. <laughs> but because he was vacuumed, um, it kind of rearranged his brain. And so he's not the same squirrel that he was prior to vacuuming. He exits the vacuum cleaner and the near-death experience with uh, powers. So it's your basic squirrel superhero kind of story. Uh, who's got questions? You should. You should have questions after that. Yes? Do I like squirrels? Yes, I do. I love squirrels. I know that there are a lot of squirrel haters out there. I'm not one of them. 
You know, some people refuse to read the book because they don't like squirrels. Mm -hmm. Yes? What's a cynic? What's a cynic? A cynic is somebody who doesn't really trust the motivations of other people. They think that uh, everybody is out for their own good. And um, Flora is not necessarily, there's a wonderful saying, scratch a cynic, find a romantic underneath. Flora is actually very much a romantic at heart, and she finds that out by the end of the book. Yes? Do I like pigs? Yes, I do like pigs. I have an astonishing list of animals that I love, and pigs are right near the top of it. Yes. So how many of y'all have read Mercy Watson? Yes. Do you know, hey, raise your hand if you know Leroy Ninker. And Yes, excellent. So Leroy Ninker is going to get his own book. That will happen next fall. He's got his own story. And it's a step up from the Mercy Watson book. So if you can read Mercy Watson, you'll be ready for Leroy Ninker by the time it comes along. So, and then after that, uh, um, Francine Poulet, the uh, animal control officer, she's got her own book. So, <laughs> yes. Is there a reason for that? Is there a reason for why every one of my anim uh, every one of my books has an animal in it? I have to say, as a sidebar, before I attempt to answer that question, that when I was seven years old, I read Black Beauty. Anybody read Black Beauty? I could not stand what happened to that horse. And so from that point on, I, who, I was a very big reader. I didn't check out any book that had an animal on the cover. So the great irony to me of looking at my books is that every one of them has an animal on the cover, and I would have read none of them because <laughs> I would have been afraid about what was going to happen to the animal. Um, I, I love animals. I thought for a long time I was going to be a veterinarian until I was like 10 years old, I thought that. Um, but I don't sit there and think, I've got to put an animal in the book. It just keeps on happening. And I guess it's because I love animals. Although I have to say that, and I found this out with the first book, When Dixie, that um, we sometimes as readers we're more likely to open our hearts to a, an animal protagonist than we are to a human. So it's a shortcut into people's hearts. So. Not that I'm cynical enough to use that. <laughs> yes. Karn. Flare up like flame. <clears throat> this is wonderful. I've never gotten this question before. Um, flare up like flame is a direct quote from a Rilke poem. And of course, it would be in a book about a squirrel, right? <laughs> and it's, it, it means make yourself into your biggest self. Um, be who you were designed to be. Flare up like flame. Uh, the squirrel loves poetry and ends up writing his own poetry. And Tootie, the next door neighbor, Tootie Tickham loves poetry and she quotes poetry to him and that's how Rilke gets in there. And I can't really explain what Rilke's doing in a book about a squirrel. Yes. Did anyone inspire me for the character of my squirrel? Well, you know, the whole thing started um, because I had a squirrel that was dying on my front steps. And I didn't know what to do for him. He wasn't bleeding, but he was obviously unwell. And I, he was draped across the front steps. If I stepped really close to him, he didn't move, so I knew he wasn't healthy. And, but I could see him breathing, and I kept on going out to look at him, and finally I called one of my best friends who lives a block and a half away, and I said, I don't know what to do. There's a squirrel dying on my front steps. And she said, and she is the sweetest and kindest of all of my friends, she said, do you have a shovel? <laughs> And I'm like, well, yeah, I've got a shovel. And uh, she said, get a t-shirt, get the shovel, and I'll come over there and I'll whack him over the head. <laughs> and so I was on the cell phone and I was very near the squirrel when she was saying this, and I'm like backing away so he can't hear it, right? <laughs> and so then I go in the back door, go in the house, look out the front door, and he has, he left. So obviously he did over here, and he thought he would go die in a less violent way. Um, but I thought, I started to think about, there's a wonderful quote from E.B. White uh, that was in a promotional flyer for Charlotte's Web, that he was going to feed the pig, and he thought about how short a pig's life was, and he started to think about ways to save a pig's life. So I started to think about ways to save a squirrel's life, and here we are. The squirrel got saved. Yes? 
We're going to do, obviously, we're going to be doing a poetry symbolism workshop here, which I have to tell you, I am not well outfitted for. So the second part of that is a flare up like flame and make big shadows that I can move in. So if you're making yourself your biggest self and you're flaring up like flame, then you're going to make big shadows. Yes, I, I did a great job of explaining it, didn't I? Uh, yes. What inspired me to write the book? One thing was the squirrel dying on the front steps. And the other thing was that uh, my mother had passed away earlier in the year, in January of the year. The squirrel showed up in April. My mother had passed away in January. My mother had a vacuum cleaner, an Electrolux tank vacuum cleaner, that she was very worried about what was going to happen to it after she was gone. Because she thought it was the best vacuum cleaner ever. And she kept on saying, I don't know what's going to happen to the vacuum cleaner when I'm gone. And I would always say, I'll take the vacuum cleaner. Why would you worry about the vacuum cleaner, you know? So she passed away. I took the vacuum cleaner. It was in my garage. And every time I pulled into the garage, I saw it. And I thought, it made me sad. I thought I needed to do something about the vacuum cleaner. So this is what I did. I combined the vacuum cleaner with the squirrel. And here we are. What inspired me to write When Dixie? Um, when Dixie was the first book, um, and I grew up in uh, Central Florida. I moved here when I was uh, 30 years old, and I wrote that book during uh, one of the worst winters on record here. And do you know where When Dixie takes place? Florida. And if you grew up in Florida and it's the worst winter on record in Minnesota, where would you like to be? Florida. So I wrote a book that could take me back home. That's part of where it came from. And also, it was the first time in my life I'd been without a dog. How many of y'all have dogs? That's very good. How many have cats? Well, that's different. OK, so anyway, I, I couldn't have a dog in the apartment where I was living, so I made up a dog, the best dog I could imagine. And that's where Win dixie came from. Yes? Do you have a favorite children's author besides yourself? Uh, I would never put myself on the list of favorites of anything, I have to say. Um, favorite, I, I'm, I'm lousy with favorites, because I have different things that I love for different reasons. But if you made me pick one favorite writer of books in general, I would say E.B. White. Yeah, because uh, he, he wrote books for people, yes. How long does it, uh, well, you know what? I can't think of it in terms of chapters. I think of it in terms of pages. So I, and when I'm writing the book, I don't leave a chapter break, you know? I just go, if I finish a chapter, I'm halfway down the page. I just keep on going on that page. So I do two pages a day, and I can get a draft of a novel done, and, you know, it's usually a draft is like 100 pages. So it will take me like 50 days to do a rough draft of a book. And then when I'm done, I have to rewrite it two pages at a time. And then when I'm done with the rewrite, I have to rewrite it the third time, two pages at a time. And then when I'm done with the third rewrite, I have to do the fourth rewrite, two pages at a time. <laughs> And, uh, and the fifth rewrite, and then at that point, I let uh, some friends see it. And if they don't laugh and point at me, then I, I do a sixth rewrite and send it to my editor. So it takes a long time. Yes. So The Tale of Despero, people always ask where that book came from. It, it, it's from my best friend's son. His name is Luke Bailey. He was eight years old when, when Dixie came out. And he had never been very impressed with me before. And then all of a sudden, here I am with my name on a book. And I was visiting him. They were living in St. Louis at the time. And everywhere I went, he followed me around. And finally, at the end of the visit, he asked if he could have a private word with me in his room. So I went into his room. And he told me that he had an excellent idea for a book. And I'm like, OK, what is it? And he said, it's the story of an unlikely hero with exceptionally large ears. And I'm like, all right, what happens to the hero? He said, well, I don't know. That's why I want you to write the book. <laughs> so that's where the book came from. How long had I known him? I was, I was there when he was born. Yeah, but he never, like I said, he wasn't impressed with me until I published a book. So, and he's, um, he's out of college and married now. You know, he's all grown up. So how about if we take two, two more. Uh, right there, yes. 
Do I like dogs? Yes, dogs are my favorite animals. Who could not like a dog? I love a dog. That's right. Thank you. I love a dog. Okay, one more, one more. Who can ask the last question that kind of like sums everything up and brings everything to a wonderful close? And still, you guys leave your hands up. You're not intimidated. All right. We're not going to talk about the symbolism and poetry, are we? No. Okay. All right. Great. Go ahead. Um, what inspired you to start writing books? What inspired me to start writing books? Um, well, I'll try to, to make it very short, okay? Um, I had a perf I can? I had a professor in college who told me that I had a certain facility with words. That's a direct quote. He said, you should consider graduate school. And so I thought, what this professor was really trying to tell me is that I was wildly talented. And I thought, why bother with graduate school? So what I did was I got black turtlenecks, because that's what writers wear. And I purchased those instead of going to graduate school. And I wore the black turtlenecks all the time. And I told everybody that I was a writer. And I sat around looking bored and disdainful. And I did that for 10 years. And then I had an epiphany. You know what an epiphany is? Yeah. It's like a sudden awareness. All of a sudden, a light bulb goes off in your head. When I was 30 years old, I realized that I was never going to be a writer unless I wrote something. <laughs> so at 30, I started to write. And I started by doing a two pages a day. And, and here I am. Um, I think I'm 47, but I'm not. I'm 49. So 19 years I've been writing. Yep. Um, and I think that's a good place to, to stop. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to sign your books. Thank you for being here. I know it's really cold out, um, and I'm, I appreciate you coming out. Yeah. Okay. Ready? You have, did you, have you read all of this?